Good evening, everyone, and welcome to April Science Pub, brought to you by Oregon State University and OSU Cascades. My name is Nathan Moses, Associate Director of Events and Engagement at OSU Cascades, and it's great to have you all here tonight. This evening, we're privileged to be joined by not only one, but two faculty members within the OSU system, OSU Cascades' own Shannon Lipscomb and Barbara Brody from our OSU Extension Services in Mallard County. Our event title tonight, On the Road to Recovery, Promoting Resilience with Children and Early Educators, is going to be our topic for this evening. Before we get to our program, let's give you a quick reminder about our audience participation process using Mentimeter. Like all science pubs, hearing from the audience is one of the most rewarding parts of our show. We want to hear from you. So participants for tonight's science pub may submit questions for our presenter via the YouTube live chats or via the Mentimeter app found at www.menti.com. Tonight's event code, which you can see on the screen right now and also at the bottom of the screen throughout the presentation is 8279 Four seven five nine again. It's eight two seven nine four seven five nine. I recommend you get those mobile devices ready to go or that second browser to get that up because we are going to want to not only have uh, questions from you this evening, but a little bit of audience participation before we get going. If your question is not answered this evening, please feel free to submit it to events at osucascades.edu, and we'll make sure that our presenters get that. All right. And again, uh, we will have a Q&A period at the end of the, the, the presentation. Uh, we'll get to as many questions as we possibly can. But again, we want to make sure that, that all our viewers hear it. So even if you're watching this recorded uh, after Monday night, we want to make sure that we get those, those questions answered for you. All right, next up, we're going to talk about two upcoming events that are uh, really important we want to make you aware of. First of all, Summer Academy introduces you to a life on uh, college campus, and you'll earn $500 scholarship for doing it. Meet new friends while exploring your academic and career interests with university professors and experts. And it's summertime at Bend, so we're getting outside with daily adventures led by student leaders and staff. This is open to all high school students, from incoming ninth graders to students entering their senior year. We're going to have tracks in art, media, and tech, business, beeves, and action, invention, community, and connection, and tourism, recreation, and outdoor uh, and adventure leadership qualities. Uh, you can find information about these at osucascades.edu forward slash summer academy. Event number two is an annual tradition uh, for the OSU system. I'm going to try something a little bit different tonight. We're going to bring a special guest on. I'd like to introduce you to one of our amazing students at OSU Cascades, Kylie Linnell. I met Kylie just this year as a first year student and actually had the pleasure of hiring her to serve as a tour ambassador for OSU Cascades. I'm gonna let her tell you about this event happening at the end of April and tell us a little bit about why it's so important to her as a student. Kylie, go for it. Thanks, Nathan. Um, I'm here tonight to talk a bit about Damn Proud Day. It is on April 27th. Um, it's a day in which beavers everywhere will come together to celebrate the accomplishments of our community. Um, and support the efforts of students like me. Um, there will be a number of activities throughout all of OSU, and you're going to want to pay special attention to damnproudday.org. Um, in 15 short days, that site will be active in ways you can contribute. Um, as an example, OSU Cascades has a goal this year to increase the scholarship dollars available for students. Um, they're incredibly important to our ability to attend the university, which I can certainly testify to. Um, I had no money for college. I had no way to afford it in the slightest until I received scholarships. Um, specifically, OSU Cascades provided me with free housing um, due to my financial and first generation status. Um, and that alone was able to get me halfway through the main expenses of attending university. Um, and then the TRIO program and work study through the tour office um, has helped me quite a bit as well. Um, to be honest, I have no idea where I would be right now if I hadn't gotten lucky enough to receive the aid that I did. Um, most likely I'd be riddled with that. Um, as it stands, this college is just so unique and close-knit, and the culture is a tough one to beat. I think the most fun has kind of been the small moments, like impromptu spike ball matches and jam sessions. Um, without help and scholarships, I wouldn't have been able to experience any of that. Um, and just like generally, I aspire towards working in the nonprofit sphere after graduating. Um, this way I can help others like I was helped before. Um, I spend a lot of time today working with the nonprofit I co-founded, um, working with the TRIO program here, working in the tour office, just so that I can help other students. It's really close to my heart. Um, so I'd just like you to consider joining me and the rest of Beaver Nation in Damn Proud Day, April 27th. And thank you for your time. 
That's awesome. And, and Kylie, again, we do all this for you. And so thank you so much for your participation this evening. Uh, that's, that's awesome. So we'll see you all on April 27th. All right. So uh, traditionally, as we've done, we have a number of uh, touch points, we hope, usually with quizzes uh, that we, we put on for Science Pub. And it looks like a number of you are already participating, which is awesome. So I'm going to do a quick little screen share of what's going on. But before we get going this evening, uh, what we'd like you to do is write down three words or ideas that come to mind when you think of resilience. And this is going to help our presenters a little bit tonight to know a little bit about our audience. Uh, but let's put, put three words in there. We're going to take the next couple minutes to make sure everybody has a, a chance to, to participate. And I don't want to feed you too much, but I'll read a couple of these as we go. And of course, if these show up in multiple ways, um, we will uh, have... Uh, larger words that show up on the screen right now, uh, growth, adaptability, rebound, perseverance, bouncing back, pliable, family, empowerment. These are all wonderful, wonderful words for our presenter for the night. We'll give everybody a couple minutes uh, to, to get a couple more things up there. And again, if you uh, are just joining us, if you log into menti.com um, using the application that we've got up there on the screen right now with that event code, uh, you can participate in this first little activity. So let's, we'll get you going there. Ooh, hope. I saw hope just added and strong, pliable a couple times. This is great. Give you all about 20 more seconds. And you can continue to participate as we go along, and we'll, we'll keep these. And make sure to save it for the presenters so that they can have it uh, for future presentations. <laughs> These are great. I think we have the right audience members for tonight, so that is confirmed. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, uh, keep putting things in there. Uh, we're we're going to keep this up um, while we go through our presentation. But again, we will also have the opportunity for you all to ask questions during the presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing on this one real quick and get us going through tonight. Um, a couple things before we get going for the presentation itself. Um, we did just add in a little sheet, a little PDF document that has a number of links that the presenters tonight are going to be able uh, to be utilizing throughout the presentation if you'd like to reference. We have embedded those in the description page on the YouTube page you're currently viewing. Uh, I've sent them via Eventbrite, so you'll see them on your event page, event page through your ticket to be able to have them. And if you can't figure those two things out, we did put them on the Science Pub page for OSU Cascades with a direct link um, underneath that page. So uh, if you can't find those links at the end of the presentation, make sure you email events at osucascades.edu, and we'll make sure that you get those. All right, without further ado, the heart of our show, <laughs> we could not do this without them. I'll talk a little bit about our two presenters. So first of all, Dr. Shannon Lipscomb's research aims to identify effective ways to nurture resilience with young children and families facing adversity. She investigates how children's resilience and skills are built over time in early learning environments and in, uh, in families. Her research teams are identifying positive social factors to protect children from negative effects of adversity and trauma, including new work on exposure to toxic chemicals. Much of this work involves strengthening supports for adults, for the adults and children's lives, and is conducted collaboratively with community organizations, schools, and public health providers. So Shannon's going to be our first presenter tonight, and I'd like to introduce you to Barbara Brody, uh, is an associate professor of practice and has served Oregon State University Extension in Milo County since 2019. Part of joining OSU Extension team, she served as an extension agent with University of Idaho and California. Barbara received her MS from California State Polytech University and is a certified facilitator. She uses her drive and motivation to deliver community-based programs and develop systems to address community needs. Her overall duties include designing, developing, teaching, coordinating, and evaluating family and community health and non-traditional 4-H youth development programs that focus on increasing the overall health and quality of life at all ages. Her passion is to establish and maintain partnerships with local agencies and organizations that meet the identified needs of the community. I would like to welcome to the digital stage tonight, Shannon and Barbara. Thanks, Nathan. Welcome, everyone. I'm Shannon Lipscomb. I get to start us off today, so I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Let's see here. 
Okay. I think we've got it. How's that look, Nathan? You good? All right. So I'm going to start by sharing with you some research on resilience and then some specific work that we're doing with early educators and children and families here at OSU Cascades and in Central Oregon. And then Barbara is going to take over and share about a collaboration that's really come out of this research and that's based in Malheur County. Then I'll be back. We'll wrap up together with some ideas for how you can get involved in this exciting work and we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, so before we jump in, I just wanted to acknowledge that there are whole teams of researchers and students and collaborators in the community, lots of families and teachers um, that have participated in this work and that really make it possible. So thank you so much to all of you who are here that have been involved and all of you who maybe will watch this later on um, after tonight. We also acknowledge that we gather for this session tonight on the homelands of tribal nations who were forcibly removed. And we honor the lands and the native people, past and present, who steward this land and show tremendous resilience. Um, currently, I'm joining you from the Cascades campus of Oregon State University, which is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Wasco, Paiute, and Warm Springs peoples, um, some of whom have participated with us in the Roots of Resilience program that you'll hear about tonight. Um, also tonight, when we discuss the strengths of OSU as a land-grant university, that serves the entire state, all counties through OSU extension. We also acknowledge that much of the land that was granted to OSU and to 51 other public universities to make higher education accessible was expropriated indigenous land. Okay, so let's talk about resilience. Um, we're gonna start with some myth busting and then we'll come back to some of those words that, that you all shared with us early on. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna pause for just a minute and think, what is resilience not? What might be some myths? Resilience is something that is talked about so widely out there. And I love, um, I think it's just so wonderful that resilience means so much to so many people. Um, and there are some myths that are important to dispel. So we're just going to start off with that. So I'm going to pause and be quiet for 10 seconds. Have you just jot down a little idea or think about it in your head? What is resilience not? Okay, I'll help you out. <laughs> uh, resilience is not a personality trait that only some of us have and others don't. Resilience is for everyone. It's actually probably my very favorite thing about resilience and I have a lot of favorite things about resilience. Um, it's a natural human process and everyone, all of us can be resilient. Also, um, resilience is so much more than grit or determination or perseverance alone. I saw a lot of you mentioned perseverance. It's absolutely important to resilience. Um, but it's so much more than that. We can't simply pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And resilience does not happen in isolation. So what is resilience? Uh, as scientists, we define resilience as positive adaptation in the face of adversity. So it's a process. It's not a destination. Resilience is something that slowly develops with and through the people and the places in our lives. And that includes broader social forces like culture and societal experiences such as belonging and being treated fairly. Um, and at the heart of all of this, resilience is really nurtured through supportive relationships. And we all know examples of people, I encourage you to think of someone right now who have just succeeded despite all lots of great odds, lots of adversities that they may have faced. Um, and when we think about that definition of what does it mean to have succeeded, what does success look like? Um, that can be so many different things to different people or to different communities. And that's another one of my favorite things about resilience. Um, it's really powerful that it can, it's really because it's this process of adapting, it can lead to a whole variety of positive life outcomes. So there's a few examples here on the slide, health, physical health, uh, mental health, spiritual health, as well as creativity and innovation and success in school and jobs and so many more things. Um, yet, it's also important to mention when we think about the power of resilience to lead to so many outcomes that we may not see them in the short term and we may not see them when they feel most important. When we wanna 
the achieving these positive outcomes. Um, resilience does take time. It is a process that develops slowly, but we can trust in that process that when we consistently build resilience processes, we do get to these kinds of outcomes. So how do we do that? Together, we nurture resilience through what we call protective factors. And I saw at least one of you included that phrase protective factors on that Mentimeter. So um, that was exciting to see. This is not uh, this is not a new concept for everyone. Um, but protective factors are just ways that we can nurture and support resilience. And we can categorize those into three general areas. Uh, the first is individual skills and perspectives like self-regulation and persistence, and as many of you mentioned, as well as having a growth mindset, which is that belief that we can improve our abilities by trying new things and learning from our mistakes. Um, and these individual skills and perspectives are really important to resilience, but they don't achieve it by themselves. And it, it, these individual skills also develop through the relationships and through the community. So these other areas of protective factors contribute to the individual skills and, and perspectives. Um, in the middle here, we have relationships, social connections and relationships that are supportive are really at the heart and the center of resilience. And that is because human connections those connections between us, they shape the neural connections in our brains. And truly our brains are, so, our brains are social organs. Um, finally, we have community resources and supports and they can go a really long way to nurturing resilience, especially when they create a sense of belonging and also of knowing where to go to get help and knowing that help will be there. So all of those social services, physical health, mental health services, basic needs supports around housing and nutrition and libraries and parks, all of those wonderful opportunities that we have in our communities, those can go a long way to supporting resilience. And this is also where culture and religion and traditions and other community groups come into play. So some of the newer research is showing that nurturing resilience can have generational impacts. It's really exciting. It's a newer area of study. Um, I'll briefly mention uh, one particular example that you can find out more about on that HeckmanEquation.org website that is mentioned on this slide. Um, it comes from the Perry Preschool Project, which you may be familiar with. It's one of the best known early childhood programs with long-term impacts documented by research and as well as cost savings documented. Um, and we've known for many years that children who participated in this really high quality early learning program show the long-term positive benefits, things like reduced crime rates, better high school graduation, less teenage pregnancy. Um, but the newer findings are that the children of those children who had originally participated in Perry Preschool, those kids are now adults and they are also showing some of those same positive impacts. So that's really powerful. This is all compared to a control group of kids and families that didn't participate. It's a really well done study. So it begs the question, how does this happen? And it seems as though some of that is taking place through those protective factors that we were talking about, those positive family relationships and resources. Um, it's also possible that some of it may take place through epigenetic processes, which is what inspired the visual I chose for this slide. Um, there's this other field of research, you won't find out about this on the Heckman Equation website, but there's other research on epigenetics. And epigenetics means really above the genome. And what that is, is it's what controls our expression of our genes, so turning them on and off and up and down. And that epigenome is impacted by things like what we eat, how we sleep, um, exercise behaviors, the contaminants in our environments, and also by things like stress and relationships, those things that do impact resilience. And so it's a new area of study to see whether epigenetics or how epigenetics might be contributing to some of this intergenerational resilience. So stay tuned for more on that. So we also have to acknowledge adversity when we talk about resilience, because this is the context in which resilience takes place. There's a lot here. So I encourage you to take a deep breath. If this is a slide that might feel overwhelming to you, it does to me oftentimes. When I think about all the different kinds of adversities that we and, and that young children are facing um, right now. This is a tough time. It's been a tough time for a number of years. And in addition to the pandemic that we've been living through, there are so many other kinds of adversities that, that we as humans are facing. So we're just gonna unpack that a little bit. Um, there is quite a lot of research that's paid attention to what's shown here in the tree around household ACEs. So adverse childhood experiences is abbreviated as ACEs. You'll hear me talk about it that way. 
Um, that includes things like abuse and neglect, parent incarceration, substance abuse in the household, as well as things like bullying that can take place in schools or in neighborhoods. And uh, quite a lot of research now is showing that children who experience more of these, a higher number, throughout their whole first 18 years of life, um, are more likely to experience difficulties as children, but also throughout their whole life course, even into adulthood. This research actually started in adults looking backward, backwards into their childhood. And um, this happens because ACEs often cause trauma. It leads to this elevated stress response in our brains and our bodies. It affects our immune systems and so many different uh, human systems that impacts a lot of different kinds of outcomes. So um, health and well-being kinds of outcomes as well as productivity and relationships. Um, also, as a field, we're advancing our study of ACEs. So you'll see number two here at the bottom um, underneath the tree. These are adverse community environments that we can think about like they're in the soil of our society. So we have poverty, we have lack of jobs, unstable, unstable housing, discrimination. These are adverse community environments that may contribute to the household environments and they can also occur separately from. At OSU here, we're conducting a study right now where we're looking at a, a newer area of adverse community environments, we're actually looking at chemical flame retardants that children are exposed to and how that um, impacts their early development, and also whether resilience processes may be at play to help protect children from some of those chemical contaminants. So that's a study that um, is one of those links in that document that Nathan mentioned, and we'll mention it uh, again at the end. We'll remind you, you can learn more about that study and even enroll uh, in that study if you have young children in your life. It's going on right now and we're recruiting participants. So that's really exciting. I'm teaming up with a whole bunch of other researchers at OSU to do that study right now. Um, and then in the third area, we have adverse env environments that are these broader things like climate crises and natural disasters and importantly, pandemics. So this is a lot um, and these ACEs can pile up, they can exacerbate one another. Um, and so let's just pause and go back to this concept of resilience. Fortunately, because resilience is not a personality trait that only some kids have and they have it or they don't. We actually as a society can cultivate and directly build resilience in our communities to overcome these kinds of adversities. And we do that through those protective factors. And we'll give you some more tangible examples when Barbara takes over later um, of some of our work that can share some strategies with you. Um, I also just wanted to mention before leaving this um, lengthy slide <laughs> is that many of us who work in this area of human resilience, um, we acknowledge resilience has to take place in the context of adversity and that these things do occur in society, but we are also working and striving to directly reduce the number and the prevalence of these kinds of ACEs so that not so many children have to adapt to them. Okay, a couple of years ago, um, and this, these data were actually collected before the pandemic, but it was just published last year. Um, we conducted a study here in Central Oregon and preschoolers and found them, the majority of them already by ages three or four years of age, they were already experiencing at least one of these adverse childhood experiences. We focused on those that were in the tree, those home and household and school and neighborhood kinds of ACEs. And their parents reported just the number of ACEs that they had experienced. They didn't tell us which ones, how many, and majority had at least one. And you can see if you look at, you add up the two um, darker blue slices of the pie, you'll see that 44% of children had two or more ACEs already by this age. And then we trained researchers to go in and observe and assess children's development. And they didn't know how many ACEs the children had. When they assessed children who had more ACEs, when we were able to link those things in our analysis, we saw that children with more ACEs showed more negative engagement in their preschool setting, so more conflict with peers and teachers, as well as less behavioral control. Um, and they also showed lower skills in early math and early self-regulation. And we know that these are the building blocks for later learning and development. And they also show that children are struggling in real time. So in response to all of this kind of research, our own findings and the findings of lots of our colleagues across the country and across the globe, really, we developed a program called Roots of Resilience, Teachers Awakening Children's Healing. And this was funded by the US Department of Education 
We led it here at OSU Cascades along with Corvallis um, colleagues and colleagues at the University of Oregon and University of Southern Maine and lots of early learning providers and partners throughout Central Oregon. And I'm going to share just a tiny bit about this program. You can find more about that on the web. We have lots of resources. I presented some about it in some different ways before. So I'm just going to give you a few snippets about the program, the research we're doing, and then turn it over to Barbara to talk more about some new developments and new innovations that's based on this work. So the purpose is to help early childhood teachers to nurture resilience with children impacted by trauma. And we knew long before the pandemic that lots of early childhood teachers could not make it to in-person workshops and courses. And so we designed an online course and video-based coaching to reach working, practicing early childhood teachers, many of whom live and work in remote settings, oftentimes by themselves in small home-based childcare programs. Um, and one of the key messages that really drives and underlies all of the work we do with Roots of Resilience is that we see children's behaviors as signals of their needs based on their prior experiences. So this is taking a trauma-informed approach to seeing children and engaging with children. And due to lots of requests from our local community in 2019, this wasn't part of the original grant, but we were asked to do workshops. So we started doing these workshops, they were so much fun. You can see a few pictures from one of them here that I, I held at OSU Cascades. And, um, and then in 2020, of course, we figured out how to do them online. And we started training others, uh, such as Barbara, to offer those trainings in additional communities and to more people. And also thanks to a colleague, Lorena Rodriguez, um, who I think is joining us tonight, we were able to make these workshops available in Spanish. So big shout out and thanks to Lorena for that work as well. Um, in Roots of Resilience, we use a metaphor of a young child as a seedling, and as it grows into a young tree, the stronger the roots grow underneath the ground, which we typically can't see, then the stronger the rest of that tree develops. And these roots are like the neural connections in a child's brain. Um, although we don't see them, they're directly impacting the health and the well-being and the development of that tree, of that child. Then children's behaviors and words, they're like the leaves and the branches. Those are the things we see, the things we hear from young children, and they give us clues about what might be happening underground, including that adversity or trauma that may be taking place in children's lives. And just like dry or rocky soil makes it hard for a tree to develop to its full potential, adversity also hinders young children's development. But we also illustrate here that we can create conditions to nurture resilience. So early childhood teachers are the gardeners of children's roots of resilience. And with our programming, we focus on the gardeners. We focus on their strengths and pour in support for their own self-care and their own self-regulation, as, as, as well as skill building in order to help them nurture resilience. And then these tools, these gardening tools are representing the skills and the knowledge and the strategies that teachers are using and the sunshine is here to remind us that we have a community wrapping around supports uh, for teachers and families and children. And so ultimately, when we cultivate resilience in these ways, we have healthier and more vibrant forests in our communities and in our societies at large. So we conducted research um, all along the way with Roots of Resilience. I'll share just a tiny bit of that with you and you can follow up to find out much more. We have uh, research briefs as well as uh, research peer reviewed articles available for you. Um, in the first few years, we studied implementation of the program, meaning we asked questions like, is it feasible? Will they do it? Do they complete it? What do people like? What do they not like? How can we improve it? And so we had a whole bunch of research just to figure that out and to improve the program and iterate it over and over again. Um, and then the year prior to the pandemic, that school year before the pandemic, we were lucky with timing there, um, we conducted a rigorous study focused on outcomes and we enrolled teachers who participated in the program and then others who wanted to, but we they were randomly assigned to a waitlist comparison or control group in order to be able to evaluate the impacts of the program. So we took assessments before and after participation and it was a small study with only about 30 teachers. And so we are seeking funds to do more and more extended research with a larger and more diverse sample. Um, but we do we did have a really rigorous design. So we have some confidence that there are, these are some important impacts that we're starting to see. So I'll share some highlights you can see here in the table. 
the amount of improvement in each of the outcomes for teachers who participated in Roots of Resilience and the children in their care. And this is above and beyond or compared to that waitlist comparison group of teachers. And these are outcomes that we chose because they align with those protective factors that we were talking about earlier. And they're all things that we can measure directly by observing and assessing using really systematic tools. And we saw positive impacts on teachers' emotional support of children from before to after participating, and also improvements in negative engagement, so reductions in that conflict, improvements in that behavior control, and also improvements in math skills. We didn't see impacts in every area though. You can see some of those here on the slide that we did not see impacts on or those not circled. And we'll be studying all of this in further research. Additionally, a doctoral student, Hillary Lewis, who's now a postdoctoral scholar at OSU, um, she conducted interviews with a lot of the teachers who participated in the program. And she and another student, Christina, um, analyzed all the transcripts and they found these three common themes that just really popped out about how teachers talked about their own experiences with the Roots of Resilience program. Almost all of them mentioned something related to their shifting in their thinking or perspective taking that's consistent with what we call a trauma-informed approach. So it's a shift in their thinking about how they're seeing and engaging with children considering trauma. So this teacher doesn't use the term trauma, but you can pay attention to her words. She says, the course just helped me constantly reiterate that to myself. They're not doing this to be a pain. They're doing this for a reason, and they're just calling out for help. Now, the second category is a shift in day-to-day -day interactions with children. And this teacher is one example shared with us that that's more on my radar like every afternoon to just check in with him. And I look forward to that part of my day. And then the third category is teachers shared about their own self-regulation and their own self-care or well-being. And this teacher explained to us that she said, I'm more aware of my own emotional states. I can be like, hey, I'm going to walk away for a few minutes because I'm feeling really frustrated. Um, and then the final quote at the very bottom is just a fun one because many teachers are um, hesitant to film themselves for video coaching up front. Um, and then they end up loving it. So this teacher shares, she says, it ends up being so much fun. I got so much out of it that I would really recommend it to that anybody do it. So um, our next steps, this is my last slide. Uh, we're moving in all sorts of different directions. We've been really focused on serving more teachers. There's been a lot of interest, um, a lot of demand, and feels very important and compelling to us to make this program accessible to our community. So we've been working on finding sponsors for that, and can, we'll continue that work. At the same time that we're also seeking funds to do more research um, on this program and on other aspects of resilience. Um, and then we're moving sideways too. So we're creating more innovations coming out of this um, strong foundation of Roots of Resilience. And Barbara will share with you this OSU extension project. And then um, another one that's exciting to me right now is that I received a mini grant from the OSU Advantage Accelerator program and that specifically to do some market research and to build my own skills and thinking about kind of the market and the business side of this um, to find different ways to bring tech the technology of Roots of Resilience into more of the daily life and experiences um, of early childhood teachers. So more to come in those areas and um, thanks for your interest and attention and I'm going to pass it off to my wonderful colleague Barbara Brody and I've got your slides for you Barbara. Thanks, Shannon. So that was a lot. And every time I listen or talk to um, Dr. Liskom, it's more learning. And so we're gonna share a little bit first about, so you understand the whole process. And many of you probably do know about extension. Most of you, if I say 4-H or ag, experiment station, anything like that, it brings it to mind. But did you know that OSU extension is in every county in Oregon? Did you know OSU Extension has been in existence for more than 100 years? So the why, why do we do this work? OSU Extension has to collaborate with local partners to provide trusted expertise and science-based knowledge to address these critical needs that Dr. Liscom has been sharing in our communities across Oregon. And I say needs of our community. It's not a top down, it truly is looking at the needs. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about Niagara County's needs. For this project, the critical issue and the need was to build resiliency and capacity in our community around resilience. 
The programs, partnerships, volunteer opportunities are all focused on the what. So those are some of our program areas. But today for this project, we're gonna talk about um, healthy communities and economies. And my job is actually split. I, split. I am a 4-H um, faculty, family community health, and then I also oversee the SNAP Ed program in our community. So the how, how do we do this? And this was really exciting when we started talking about this, the how. Shannon, um, Dr. Liscon talked about that. Megan Pratt is also one of our partners on this committee, on this research, and my colleague, Teresa Frazier. So the how, we do research. We do education and engagement. We use volunteers as the backbone of many of our programs. And then those community part partnerships. So Mather County is a rural frontier area. It's actually on the border, if you don't know, of Idaho. And we're actually the only county in Oregon that's on mountain time. So we have that geographic isolation. We have a relatively smaller population and we have the highest child poverty rate, which really, really, when um, Dr. Liscom talked about the ACEs, poverty is down in the roots. And we have a 30.5% poverty, child poverty rate, compared to Oregon's overall, a six, just over 16%. Let me repeat that. We have a 30.5 compared to Oregon's overall at 16.6. I challenged you to find out your community's poverty rate. Now here County, a lot of people don't know, we have more ethnic diversity than other parts of Eastern Oregon with, and all of Oregon, with 33% of our population identifying as Latinx, and 5% have another minority group. So poverty, again, was one of those ACEs listed. And from the research and the work that we've done in our community, we all know that child uh, poverty is a predictor of negative social outcomes, and then that increased demands for services. So children experiencing poverty are less likely to be successful in school, are likely to have um, negative health outcomes and a greater difficulty later on in life, just like the other, other ones. So we're gonna look at the project itself. And this slide is really gonna talk about the project. So one of the roles, I just talked about some of the data about Mount Hare County. One of the roles of extension faculty be it be ag, um, natural resources, outdoor school, we all do local needs assessment. And I told you some of those needs. But at the top, our community knows, we did a poverty simulation to help build this. And I got a call from a community partner that saw Dr. Liscom presenting. So I wasn't even the first connection. When I spoke earlier about the importance of community partners, we need you in extension and we, want to hear from you. So a community, two community partners called me and they had, um, they're in the early childhood group and they called and identified this need. They said, we need to do some work around this um, roots of resilience and resiliency. Next, I picked up the phone. Um, they gave me Dr. Liscom's name. I picked up the phone and she's at Cascade campus, actually was on sabbatical, still responded to our need. and. Connected, we connected, and the conversation started with her research. So we started talking about what our needs were, that I had a community group in place, a community coalition in place, and then she brought in Dr. Uh, Megan Pratt. And together, we really started that first conversation. Matt talked all along. My local um, colleague, Teresa Frazier, works closely with the CASA program, and so we were all talking about it. With Dr. Liscom's expertise and um, her program, that brought us on board with the research. Dr. Megan Pratt oversees is it the Corvallis campus. She provides leadership for the Oregon Childhood Child Care Research Partnership. And her disciplinary expertise in family policy, early childhood, brought that other piece. And then I had the local piece and was locally connected. So we went on and we started um, talking to the community partners, the first thing they wanted was to have some of those workshops that Dr. Liscom um, spoke of. And we're gonna talk about the impact of those. But the other thing that came out was, in talking to them was, Barbara, how do we tell this story in our community? How do we talk to parents? How do we, how do we know we're doing this training, but we don't have something to give them. We need some kind of research fact sheet. 
And so we went back um, to Shannon and said, you know, this is what the community is needing. Talk to her, have the conversation. She's like, okay, talked a little bit more. So it was truly, I want to make the point that it was truly community driven. And then this multidisciplinary team brought that forward. So you'll see on the left, we're going to talk a little bit about the info sheets. And this is an action that we were talking about, nurturing resilience. We were also very diligent in wanting them to be in English and Spanish. And so needs all along the way and input from our community was really highlighted. Today we're presenting, this is, um, you're the second group or third group, Shannon presented to a group and then I presented to our local coalition last week about these new info sheets. And so we're doing these community presentations. We have a social media toolkit that's ready for you to share at the end of this. We'll talk about that. And then we're really bringing more of my extension colleagues. So if this is something in your community, an agency, um, reach out to extension. So we're sharing with colleagues across um, the state and then hopefully the nation, we can push this out. I'm gonna share a few of our impacts. So our community coalition um, was, was small but mighty and we have built it. DHS has been a, a huge partner with helping us and helping with funding. So funding was a part and um, we received some funding in the beginning from our Halley Ford Center and on campus for some grassroots funding. But also one of our community coalition partners said, Barbara, we have local funding. And so that community coalition really plays a part. So we applied for that. And then again, just applied locally and received more funds. Also along the way, not only are we building that local capacity, I'm building my own capacity. So myself and my colleague didn't have that. Um, I didn't have any knowledge in this area, but reached out. So I've been a learner in this Tri-Learner project with that. The third one is the engagement I talked about, Dr. Pratt's research, Engagement at Oregon Child Care Research Partnership. That link also is in, if you wanna learn more about that, is in the um, publication that we put on the website. So Roots of Resilience, we did the two PD workshops and we did those virtually, so we didn't get to engage. But part one we had in April and we had 32 participants from Mount Hare County and part two, we had 24 participants. So we received, they received over um, three hours for each session. And then we went on and have, we're in the middle of a Roots of Resilience online course. So we have been scaffolding our capacity and building our knowledge locally. And we currently have nine people going through that. And, and all of these I speak of, we have been through, Teresa and I have been through to build our capacity alongside them. So we've been learning with our community and then we come to these peer reviewed info sheets. And this is really exciting. This was the funding, our backbone funding originally from the Halley Ford Center for Healthy Children and Families. So that's the next thing that we're gonna talk about. So this is just two of them. The, the audience is our early child care providers, parents, teachers, community partners, self-sufficiency, anybody who is face-to-face -face with families our head starts. So the first one is one of the issues. We have three. One is protective factors for resilience. It, um, the second is interactions with the heart or resilience. And that's the one that you see on the right with the hearts. And then mindful practices for resilience is the third one. And that's on the left. And I spoke about intentionally putting them in English and Spanish. So on the back side of these, one side is English and the back side is Spanish. So really made them easy for you to use as community partners. You don't have to ask anybody what language they need them in. So it's really inclusive. So we're gonna share a little bit more. There's links on how to do this. So I'm gonna pass it back, or Shannon and I think gonna tag team this. If we can both get up the same, get on the screen. <laughs> we'll see if we can both get on the screen. If there not, we you go. can hear me. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back. Hi. Nice work. Thanks so much, Barbara. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in with the first one. Something that you can do if you're interested in getting more involved as a learner, and especially if you are an early childhood teacher or you're someone who works with early childhood teachers, is you can enroll in our online course. And you can learn about that and uh, enroll in that through our blog. And specifically, there's a link on that info sheet page 
that tells you, links you specifically to the online course and enrolling in that. If you ever have questions about any of these next steps too, you can email us and we can help you find the right path towards these action steps. And um, we do have course uh, cohorts of the online course running most of the time. We usually start a new cohort a couple of times a year and it is self-paced. It is pretty extensive. It's about 30 hours. Uh, it does work for if you're in the early learning field. Um, professional development hours on the Oregon registry at set two or that intermediate level. And you can find out much more about that on the blog. Barbara, you wanna talk about the next one? So the next one is use and share those nurturing resilience info sheets. As we said, I worked with our communications, OSU communications department. They put together a whole social media kit for you. The link is in that sheet that um, we spoke about earlier that Nathan's gonna, has linked everywhere. He'll talk about that again. You can use those at community events. You can put them in your newsletters. You can print them. You can find them online, anything like that. If you're doing a training for anybody, um, go ahead and use them. Then and, the next one. And Barbara, do you want to say, do you want to share? We, we just started sharing about these and partners are already asking for hundreds of copies of them. Mm -hmm. So we have funding to do that. Um, but for you also, you can directly just download them. So they are available in PDF. So um, please use them. They're free. We want to get them out there as far and wide as possible. And we do hope to develop another series um, that's more focused on uh, trauma-informed approaches specifically and understanding trauma and adversity as a follow-up. So let us know what you'd want to see from those as well. If you're to shoot us an email if you have more ideas. Um, the third one is to sign up for the school readiness study. So sometimes I call this the flame retardant study. This is that one where we're looking at flame retardant chemicals and children's exposure to those in preschool, how that affects development from preschool through first grade. We're working on enrolling about 500 kids across Oregon. Uh, it's a study that takes place in Central Oregon here out of OSU Cascades and also with a team out of OSU Corvallis. And we're, we're reaching many different communities. I think we have about 200, 250 kiddos enrolled so far, and we are still going strong and we'll be enrolling more early learning programs uh, and children and families in that study is next year as well. So please consider uh, signing up, sharing it with others, getting the word out. And I guess the last one's mine too. So uh, another thing I haven't mentioned yet, there's just so much happening in early learning right now. It's very exciting. And OSU Cascades in particular, in partnership with our community college, Central Oregon Community College and task force throughout Central Oregon, we're really kind of moving and shaking in early learning and childcare. And one of those areas that we have a variety of partnership funding for is this early childhood career development program which includes free tuition for college at OSU Cascades or COCC and paid work experience and or paid internship experience. So there's a link to that and you can find out more on our website. I think that's it other than our contact information. You can get a hold of us and we included our contact for Dr. Megan Pratt who is uh, the third very essential member of our team and um, Teresa Frazier, who Barbara mentioned, can also be reached through Barbara and the Extension Office in Nyer County. So thank you so much, everyone. We are, I, I think that's it, Barbara, we're good. I think that's it, we're ready for questions. All right, well, perfect. And mm, before we get to that, I'll let uh, Brent switch us over, but just a couple of reminders, again, at the bottom of your screen, uh, you're going to see the event code 82794759. Uh, we've got a couple questions that have come in already through the Minty app, uh, but make sure that you are uh, shooting us some questions about anything tonight. Um, and then additionally, if you are on logged in uh, to the YouTube channel, you can just pop a, a question in chat as uh, Jolene had done already. So a uh, couple other reminders outside of how to submit questions. Again, those links that we talked about tonight, if you go, I put this in chat too, if you go into the description of this video, you can literally uh, scroll down through the description at the very bottom, there's a PDF link in there that will have a single page PDF uh, link to everything that Shannon and Barbara were talking about. Today. So definitely make sure you, you take a look at that. All right, uh, we'll see. First off, uh, I will get to our first question. And again, everybody, uh, that event code, if you go to minty.com, 82794754, uh, oh, wow, 
Uh, if you want to put that, that question in there, I'll go to the YouTube chat. Um, first question we have for the night, will the recording of this presentation be sent out later? Nobody ever asks this during Science Pub. They always email me the night after because they missed it. The answer is yes. The great thing with streaming these is the exact same link that you opened up tonight will be available about 30 minutes after the presentation this evening to share with friends, colleagues, whoever else. This is really great information, uh, but we do keep this up on the OSU Cascades uh, YouTube channel. So this exact link that you use to the Eventbrite ticket is what you could share with other people or pour up, uh, pull up a couple days from now as you are running on your treadmill at nine o'clock at night, uh, winding down for the day. So. Uh, we get we get folks watching Science Pub uh, at all times of day. Uh, the other thing, not a question. Very nice job, presenters. Sometimes people leave comments in Minty. Uh, they thank you for your time this evening, and I thank you as well for joining us. Uh, first question. Let's go with, and this is the time in which my head bounces back and forth from the screen as I'm going through my three screens. Uh, Jolene from the LTDC board. Uh, just a quick question on the Central Oregon study. Uh, how many students, and it looks like maybe uh, POC participants of color is what she's representing. Um, how many uh, students of color participated in those studies? Thanks for the question, Jolene. It's great to great to have you here. Um, so. Off the top of my head, I can give you an estimate. Not, and I'll say not nearly as many as we would like. Um, our participants in the research here at OSU Cascades in these studies that I was describing, there's a couple of different studies with a couple of different samples, tend to be fairly similar demographically to our surrounding area, mostly Bend and Redmond. We're working on and putting a lot of effort on recruiting um, all the way up through Warm Springs, Madras area, um, out to Lapine, down to Lapine, Southways, and out eastern in Kirk County. But most of our participants have come from the Bend area, which means we have about, I think, 15 to 20 percent. Um, children tend to be either, um, we don't ask them to identify as a person of color, we ask specific racial and ethnic categories. So either tend to be not identifying as white or white and another racial or ethnic group. Great, thank you for that. Let's see here. Uh, one of the questions relating to some of the research, Shannon, I think you showed earlier. Uh, for the Roots of Resilience impact scores, what was the scale? I didn't catch how much improvement that the scores actually represented. Great question. So what I what I shared with you was called what are called effect sizes. And that is actually looking at a measure that tries to create a consistent way of talking about the size of an effect regardless of what kind of scale those measures are on, because I, sh I showed you five, I think, five different measures that each have their own scale. So if we were to provide them on a graph, for example, they would be all over the place and we're comparing kind of apples to oranges there. So the effect size evens that all out. And um, an effect size in this area does affect, for example, 0 0.5, 0 0.54 for the effect on emotional support that teachers were offering or engaging with children. That we, what we do is we compare that to results in other studies. And it was really exciting to see that our Roots of Resilience project was impacting at the side of 0.54 was very comparable to other studies that have actually been designed specifically to change that measure. So there are interventions that are specifically targeting emotional support on that scale, the classroom assessment scoring system is the measure. And we were looking at something broader, trauma-informed practice, and we were seeing improvements at least as strong and sometimes a lot stronger actually in some of our areas than in previous studies. So we're excited about that, but we need to do a lot more research to better understand those impacts. Great, thank you. Uh, Barbara, I actually have one for you. Um, what kind of sparked any personal interest in pursuing um, research and resilience or like latching onto some of these programs from the standpoint of a community serving topic? Can you say that one more time, the second part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, what, like, what about resiliency and some of this research sparked any personal interests? Like how did you kind of get involved in this? Um, and then why do you think this is so important specifically in some of the communities that you're serving? Thank you. So it came from a community need, a community partner called. And as an extension faculty, being engaged in my community, being aware of the needs in the community, I spoke that we all do needs assessment. 
So I knew about this need, but I didn't know about Dr. Liskom's research. And so by the community um, coming forward, they were aware of her research. And because there's so many people on campus and it wasn't my wheelhouse, but an extension in family and community health um, and we're both in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences, it was basically, I needed to address this need. As a faculty, um, it, it was a passion because of our high poverty rates and anything that I could do to help the families and communities. And so, as I said earlier, building my own capacity around it and around the research. And then our research project that we're doing research on is actually a tri-learner project. And that's what's funded and it's to see what learning happens when faculty from three different, well, I'm in extension out in the community, Shannon's at Cascade campus, and then Dr. Pratt's on campus. She's in extension, but she's on campus. So really that tri-learner and how we can learn from each other. So we do have um, some initial research for groups that we're doing, our coalition, and focus groups for this other piece of research on um, how we're changing community resiliency in our community and building that capacity. Excellent, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're and welcome. this one will be really broad too, because you both are working a lot on a lot of different programs. Uh, but there aren't any resources or workshops for educators about trauma and resilience. And it sounds like specifically in adolescent or elementary age students. So maybe a little bit older groups than what you've been working on or what would you suggest? So yes, um, there are a, a growing amount of trauma-informed care professional learning in lots of fields and the K-12 education system is one of those or it's really it's really an area of a lot of growth um, in our local Central Oregon community. So if this question is coming from someone who is in uh, in Central Oregon there, I will directly encourage you to check out Culture of Care. Um, I can't remember exactly what the website is. It may be cultureofcare.org. It's pretty simple. It's through and run by High Desert Education Service District and is specifically focused on creating cultures that include trauma responsive practice, restorative justice, wellness within the K-12 school system in the six school districts throughout Central Oregon. So that, that's a great place to go. Another is Trauma Informed Oregon and they are um, coordinating with a lot of communities throughout the state around trauma-informed trainings, in particular around healthcare settings, but also in many other areas as well. They've really been expanding the different areas that they've been focusing on. Excellent. And then Barbara, anything specifically that you're working with extension around some of those groups or? We actually have um, Shauna Tomley is one of our faculty on campus. And if that person messages you, we can we can get her Shauna Tomley's um, contact as well. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I will say, Jolene, just as a reference back to you, um, I just pulled up the Let's Talk Diversity Coalition because I'm assuming that's what LTDC stands for. Uh, that, that's an amazing list of resources there too. So thank you for showing another resource to me. That's great. Um, okay. So next up, uh, okay, is there a correlation with some of the themes you found in the Roots of Resilience research in ways teachers can better serve neuroatypical students? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the overall approach, and when we think about a trauma-informed approach, is that we're really paying attention to what we see and hear from children. And, and using children's behavior and their words as, as the cues to what they need. And so that approach is relevant for children with all, all sorts of needs. Um, neuroatypical development can also be directly related to experiences of trauma. So there are more, um, we see more developmental disabilities and atypical experiences, whether they're neuro, neurodevelopmental or other um, other underlying causes in children who do experience adversity and trauma. And so there's this intersection and children are often experiencing adversity, trauma, and, and, and other needs at the same time. So sure, there are underlying mechanisms that are shared, the approaches that we take when we take a trauma-informed approach. We're actually helping and supporting 
the development of all children in teacher's care. And that's actually one of the things that's really important in this work and trauma-informed work in general. We don't need to know the trauma history of children in order to make a difference and to promote resilience. We just need to be paying attention to them and to be supported in our, to bring our, bring our best self. So a lot of that is around supporting the, the teachers, the caregivers, those adults that are working with children so that they can be regulating themselves when they engage with behaviors that are very challenging. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure if that, I hope that answered the question. If not, feel free to send a, shoot a follow-up question. But yes, there are a lot of underlying pathways that are the same and the approaches that work as well. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Yeah, and I I don't know, just, just observationally as I'm hearing you all talk, it seems like as an educator, it would feel like, oh man, if I don't know the full story, how am I able to serve that student do as effective as I can? And I think that's almost sort of a barrier that we put up as caring human beings and working with students sometimes. And the reality is what you all are talking about tonight are maybe some skill sets in which, you, like you just said, you don't have to have the full picture to be able to respond in a way that is supportive of the student and can help them build resilience. So, I mean, I think that's that's great. That's That kind of turns that on its head where we feel like we really have to get to the, well, you said roots. I hate to do puns tonight, but to getting uh, to really the full student story and what, what you're really kind of talking about is that with some of the, pr the processes that you're, you're explaining this evening, it doesn't necessarily take that. It's more of the instructor and how they're engaging. That's right. That's right, Nathan. And we we sometimes have clues about what might be going on in the full fuller picture of the story, but we can gather a lot if we think about an early childhood teacher who sees a child every day and notices patterns and pays attention to one of the things we encourage teachers to do is to work kind of like a detective and look for patterns and see are there are there triggers? What happens before those big behaviors? What happens that leads a child to turn inward and freeze up and shut down. Like there are different kinds of behavior patterns for kids that we're concerned about. And we're encouraging teachers to be, you know, really, really looking for and paying attention to those signals from kiddos that they can, that can tell us what's going on and what we might want to shift, try different strategies in the environment. Um, the other thing that while I'm talking about this, the second part of being a detective is to look at what's working well. So there are moments of success for every child. And it's easy to pay attention to the moments of challenge because those are the ones that, we're, that we often feel stressed out about, we're really concerned about. Um, but we can have a lot of impact and help kids when we also pay attention to those moments of success. So when we're looking at how, when their brain is well integrated, they're, they're self-regulating, they're self what's happening, what's working well, what's helping them to be successful and pay attention to what's happening in the environment, the noise, the kids around the time of day, the food that they might have been eating, all those kinds of things can tell us clues about how we can then shift for the future and create more of those moments with kids. I'm going to follow up on my soapbox. <laughs> no, that's great. No, it's wonderful. I'm going to follow up on that. And somebody asked about my passion. One of the things that I learned through this process is I am a lifelong learner. And by going through the training, I do a lot of day camps and week-long camps. And when kids walk through the door, I don't know them. That's one of the downfalls of doing 4-H programming or out-of-school programming. A lot of times we don't know what they're bringing. And from going through it, the very first aha moment was um, we got a classroom diagram and it was for early learners and those transitions. And I thought, I've been out of school a long time and I haven't thought about this. And so when kids are showing up to camp and they're, they've never met me before, I'm loud, I'm outgoing. And so really changing the way I do my work and great students, young people when they come in from K through 12th grade and really being mindful about that and putting in place, um, Shannon talked about the transitions. When we're transitioning from one place to the other and grouping, having quiet places, you know, making sure that they know when they come in those expectations and places that they can go to self-regulate. And so just that one um, snippet of online course, I went and immediately made those changes. So very easy to apply. And you don't have to know everything about the kid. You can apply practices yourself. And then also me coming in with mindfulness in mind and taking time for those breaks when we've done a, a five-day camp and we're on hour 70, you know, of putting in all those hours for a week. So those are two that really stuck heavy with me as a practitioner, but also as a lifelong learner. Thank you for that, Barbara. Thank you very much. Um, 
A couple of the questions about how to participate in some of the programs that are mentioned. You know, I think the biggest thing, everybody, is, is take a look at that sheet uh, that we've, we've attached in the description. That is going to have the majority of what we've spoken with tonight. But do not hesitate. Uh, pop me an email at, at, at events, uh, events, E V N. I can't spell tonight, E-V-E-N-T-S at osucascades.edu, and we'll make sure that we get you hooked up with the appropriate information. But feel free to email Shannon and, and uh, Barbara as well. Um, they're, they're sure to... Uh, Take your questions, and again, they may be able to link you some for some other programs that we didn't even specifically talk to tonight. But take a look at that reference document first and the description of this video this evening. Um, that will be really probably 90% of what you would need from the presentation this evening. So thank you very much for that question. Um, let's see here. Oh, here we go. Uh, great. Professional development, Shane. I know this one was targeted towards you, but I think, Barbara, you might be able to talk a little bit about this. Can you elaborate a little bit more about how getting involved with Roots of Resilience can help with professional development and Oregon registry steps? So the Oregon registry, the person who asked this question probably knows this, but I'll just share that the Oregon registry is the career ladder for early learning professionals in the state of Oregon. And so when, when you complete trainings, you can get credits and there are different kinds of credits. And so we here, when we were collecting, uh, you know, collecting information and ideas for Roots of Resilience, we heard very loud and clearly from our community that what was needed is the set to or the intermediate level. So the online course is already set up for um, earning 30 hours of set two training for the Oregon registry. So that just happens automatically through enrolling in the online course when you complete it. We do have an instructor who monitors that course and provides some support to it, even though it's self-paced and it's an online course. And that person then awards those credits. There are also um, credits for set two through our workshops. Um, and then some of our workshops, uh, depending upon what kind of workshop we're talking about, some of those are set one or more of those entry level or beginning workshops. And I'll just take a moment to give a, a plug for um, the early learning conference that's taking place at Central Oregon Community College on April 29th and April 30th. And it's a wonderful conference with lots of professional development opportunities. There is one for Roots of Resilience. Well, be doing, it's actually our first uh, kind of 101 to Roots of Resilience coaching. It's a three hour workshop on Saturday morning, 8.30 to 11.30. And I'll be co-leading that with Lorena Rodriguez, who I mentioned earlier, and Emiko Gogedebos, who is at the center of all things Roots of Resilience and has been with us for over six years at OSU Cascades. So wonderful people to meet. Join us on April 30th if you can for that as well. And I hope I answered your question about the Oregon Registry. Barbara, did to add? I do not. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Well, it looks like um, we had a lot of the same questions tonight. So I think as far as content, you both nailed that this evening. So very nice job with that. Uh, but if folks, again, do have any other questions, uh, we give you a couple of different resources to ask after the fact. With a lot of you viewing this event uh, after tonight on Monday, uh, I'm sure those things will come in. So please, please know again, just want to reiterate the fact that we are open to any questions you have post-event. Uh, for Barbara and Shannon, any kind of last words before we close up this evening for Science Club? We're just really thankful to be here and the, the Roots of Resilience info sheets. If there is a barrier for printing, we did get that funding to print in color. So if you just shoot um, Nathan an email or our emails and contacts are on that sheet. And if you need help um, presenting in social media, putting that together, um, we're here to support and, and our communications people will help us with that if we need it. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I guess the last thing I just want to say is that we we can't see all of you, but we do see you as our partners in this work. This is community work, and all of these ideas are are collaborative. We learn through the workshops. We learn in the research through the data that you all share with us, and so we see the research. Um, the data that you provide, the participation that you have, we see it as a gift and a contribution. I'm just so grateful to all of you who participate with us and look forward to more collaborations and sharing of ideas. Um, so thank you so much.
Perfect. And um, I'll have you two hang on with me a little bit after we, we close up shop tonight. But I want to just thank everyone again for participating uh, digitally here. We are working on an in-person science pub in May at OSU Cascade. So hopefully we'll have some information uh, for you all again. But we have really enjoyed our time doing this digitally. It's made it very easy for us to connect with community members outside of Central Oregon and then have wonderful presenters come in from all over the place. So it's been wonderful. Uh, huge thanks to you both tonight as our presenters. We cannot do this work without you. And I'm so happy that we get to send this information out the way that we do. Uh, again, special shout out to Connect Central Oregon, who's helping us with production behind the scenes, who have been successfully utilizing their career training and intern program to help us put these events on for the last almost two years now, which is pretty cool. So this concludes our science book for Monday, April 11th, 2022. Tell a friend about your experience tonight. Share this presentation link. Like I said, the exact same link you're using tonight is what you can use post-event. And we'll see you again next time, Beaver Nation, out there. Thank you very much for your time.